Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm very happy to be here tonight to share with you my journey as an architect. I was born in a small farming village in Kedah. I spent the first nine, year, nine years of my life in a very beautiful surrounding, surrounded by beautiful mountains, very few and blue sky. My father built the house I stayed in for many years. And he built the house maybe almost like 60 years ago. And to me, it is a, a very good example of green architecture. First of all, all the materials were sourced locally. Secondly, it was designed in response to the tropical environment. For instance, we have a buffer space between outside and inside. It's almost like a lanai. And secondly, I remember the focus of the entire house is our kitchen. And in the middle of the kitchen, we have this uh, big water tank, which is about eight feet by 10 feet by six feet tall, built by my father with a very good filtration system. We use it as a, as a source of like rainwater harvesting. My father used it to collect rainwater and we use it for everyday use, such as cooking, shower, and so on. So to me, this house influenced me. For the rest of my life, it was a good example of green architecture. And it was like designed with uh, almost like nothing. I mean, built with almost like minimum cost. And beside the house, beside the house itself, it, it was also like integrated in the whole environment. Outside the house, we have a chicken coop, uh, we have a pigeon, and we have a so-called like coconut, coconut trees, and uh, vegetable porch, and fish pond. We are living, we were living in a so-called green architecture or, or sustainable living many, many years ago without knowing it. Uh, behind our house, it was a river uh, connecting our kampong to Kuala to me, it is more than a river, it's a river of life. It, uh, it is a connector. It was a connector. It, was a con it connected me to the outside world, to the bigger cities. When I was small, I mean, I was say until nine years old, it was the biggest river in the world, biggest white. Many, many years after I left Kubang Rotan, in my dream, in my imagination, it was the biggest thing, the most beautiful river in the world. And uh, after I finished high school, I went back to, to my kampong and I went back to my old house. I go back to the river. I realized that it was just a very narrow, small river. But to me, it, it was the biggest river in the world, the longest river in the world. So river and water play, and play a very important part in my life and as an architect. After I finished my high school, just like all the young kids many, many years ago, all the high school graduate, all of us are dreaming of going somewhere. My brother went to Melbourne and I had brother went to Taiwan and so on or Kuala Lumpur to further their study. Somehow I was attracted to Ireland, Dublin Island. I was inspired by an article I read in a reader like just about Ireland. And I was so fascinated by River Riffey in Dublin. And I went to Ireland without any money. I spent a year there, did not know what to do. I supposed to go to school, I was very confused. I did not do anything. And I worked part time in the restaurants and so on. And then I decided that even I love the city, but I cannot continue my, my life as it was. So I decided that I should go somewhere. Where should I go? And I should go somewhere maybe warmer and, and maybe cheaper. So I went to the American Council in Labrin and asked them uh, where is, the, where is the, the, the stage in USA that I can get, find the cheapest university. And then they told me, Louisiana. And happened to be, 
I was very into Mark Twain's story, and I was into Mississippi River. So I began to do some research, and I found out that Mississippi River started from the northern part of USA and then went all the way to New Orleans, to Louisiana. That's why I ended up in Louisiana. I spent a year in the University of Louisiana studying architecture. It was a beautiful small town, but it was not challenging enough for me. It was so easy. Without having to do anything, I ended up, I was an A student without trying very hard. So I told myself, I want to go to a bigger city that will give me more challenge, give me more opportunity. Maybe I'll have opportunity to work in the architecture office as an intern and, and working part-time and so on. So I went to, to Houston for a second year. I was in Houston for four years. And Houston played a very important role in my life. The school architecture in Houston was instrumental to me as an architect. And out of the four years, we, architecture started is five years. I spent the first year in Louisiana, the next four years in Houston. Out of the four, uh, five years of architecture study, the two projects that I did during the third year of architecture school were the most important to me. The two projects influenced the way I think as an architect, influenced the way I design building and city. First one, both these two projects were design assignment during the third year. Each assignment lasted about one month. The first, the first assignment, uh, in the first assignment, we are asked to design a photography retreat outside Houston, Texas. Uh, the site is 100 acres, but the requirement is, is to design a small school of 10,000 square feet for students. Students will be there for like three weeks of uh, three months of intensive training, and so on. And I begin to ask myself, why 100 acres? What is the context for us to begin our design? If you are designing a building next to this building, you are asked to design a, a building next to this uh, manor plus and so on, you have a context. The context is a heritage area of Georgetown, how you respond to the next building, to your neighbor and so on. But in this empty area, as far as I can see in Texas, what is your context. So it, this is the first question I ask myself, what is my context? What am I going to respond to as far as my design is concerned? 100 acres with a small building inside. First, the easiest way to locate a building is to put a building next to the highway. But to me, a building is more than a building. And a push to the building, the uh, so-called the access to the building, the, the journal to the building is as important as the building itself. So I decided to put a building at the middle of the site and oriented on the so-called north-south orientation. So that when people go to the building, when you drive or you cycle or you walk, you can see the front side of the building. And then before you turn into the building, you'll, you'll see the other side of the building. And I purposely let the visitor to park the car a bit further away so, you, so that you can prepare yourself before you enter the building. It's a journey. You walk, you prepare yourself to enter the building, just like you walk to a church and so on. So this is my first approach about how to address the entrance to the building. Secondly, this is a school of photography, photography retreats. And how are we going to organize the building? The students will be there for three months. The teacher will be there for maybe a month or so. Every month they change the teacher and so on. How are you going to... When, when we talk about retreats, it's like inside world versus outside world. So I decided to organize the building in a linear, linear organization. When you design a building, just like you make a movie, there's a storyline. There's an introduction, there's a content, there's a conclusion. Just like you write a storybook, and so on, a story is the same. You must have storyline. So the storyline of this building is about, it is an architecture school, uh, so, sorry, a photography school. Students will be there for three months and they learn about photography. 
they learn about how to deal with each other and they learn about other things and as well so as you enter the building you have a reception and you have a student uh, so-called quarters dormitory and then you have a teacher and then the studio in the mirror and then you have a teacher's quarters uh, i call this the inside world and then the outside world is an exhibition and the canteen so that the student can be with outsider it's outside you're inside and outside and then the wall the long wall serves as a spine of the building through the wall you organize the building you have a, the most important part of the building you have a secondary you have the semi-private space you have a public space and so on so the spine the wall of the building serves as the spine of the building and then the the wall itself i make it almost like curvy linear in my design i always like to have something like waveformer you can you can see later in my city uh, urban design and architecture and so on you have something waveformer contrast with something more organic so that there's a comparison between something formal and organic and so on and then since this is a photography school what's the most important thing about photography is about light and shadow so the wall of the spine of the building creates a light and shadow during different time of the day and what about the context i mentioned to you about why 100 acres why in the middle of norway in texas what's the context here if you design a building in the city your context is a building next door what is this context what's the context of this building the context is earth and the sky just just like a human being i mean i mean uh, you come to this earth and you disappear you go back so it's earth and sky it's more than a building it's some philosoph philosophical meaning to it so this building is a very simple building it's a simple design and the drone is not that good it was like drawn in ink but it was very important to me the second one was also a, a third year architecture school assignment we are also given a, a month to design the program was uh, we are asked to design an addition to an existing railway station in a small town in massachusetts and it was next to a river and then their their people live on the other side of the river they took commuter they took to cross the river to go to the station many times when we are asked to design an addition to a historical building we are very scared of historical buildings so we try to design a new building look like the historical building we try to copy it symmetric and make it exactly like the historical building to me uh to the this is i think we should read beyond the surface i remember many many years ago when i was uh, in the school of architecture in university houston my professor i think he's almost like 90 years old i googled him a few weeks ago he's still a professor at university houston uh, my professor in, uh, mentioned to us we to learn to read beyond the surface and he said when you read an article we have to understand the meaning beyond the surface and then he also told us when we have to know our position in the world in the earth and so on so same thing when you have to design a building uh, in addition to an hour building for you to come out a good solution you have to understand the existing building you want to respond to in this case it's a historic building they have a central axis that's the reason i created a central axis to me once you have a central axis you the uh, by incorporate the central axis and connect Bring it to the new building you show the respect you have to the existing building you already show your respect so the rest of the building can be very spontaneous the rest of the building can be more spon more responsive to the existing environment in this case is a river can be more organic and so on so you have something very formal again and something very organic from these two uh, so-called design excitement the design principle i learned or discover i carry through to all my professional work from i was in from uh, malaysia i went to uh, so-called uh, dublin island and then i went to lafayette houston and then i went to houston princeton to work and then subsequently uh, a few years 20 years later i went to seattle uh, 
USA is a so-called a very complicated, complicated country. Very few people know about USA. They, you might be to one part of USA. You thought you know USA. It is not. USA as a country, politically, economically, it is much more divisive than Malaysia. I remember many, many years ago, I read the book written by Lee Kuan Yew, his last book before he passed away. He said that the richest person in the world lived in USA, happened to live in Seattle. So does the second richest man in the world also live in Seattle. And the poorest person in the world also live in USA. The best university in the world is in USA. The worst university is in USA. So it's just like, it's very extreme. From one city to another, from one part of the state to another, it's like different country. Seattle can be four to five times more expensive as far as the cost of living concern compared with the Birmingham, Birmingham Alabama. And in terms of culture, language, so-called slang is totally different. But for people like us, for Malaysian, we are, it is very easy for us to adapt from one city to another. Maybe due to the kind of environment we went through, it was very easy for me to adapt because we grew up in this kind of so-called multicultural, multi-religious society. And for my American friend, it was very difficult. I remember many years ago, uh, after I graduated from the university, I went to work in Princeton, New Jersey. I have a very good friend. He was born in Oklahoma, Oklahoma and grew up in Texas. He's a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. And he had to go to work in New York. He has a total cultural shock. He was so sad, so depressed, he wanted to come back to Texas all the time. And now he spent three months staying in my house. I had to become his counselor, to become his therapist. I'm a Malaysian from Kubang Rotan. <laughs> had to be a counselor to a white Anglo-Saxon American about how to live in New York. <laughs> uh, after I graduated from uh, school architecture in Houston, I went to work for a company in Princeton, New Jersey. One of my first projects was to design an aquarium. Aquarium, it was probably one of my most important jobs during my five years there. The aquarium is going to be, was located in Camden, New Jersey. Camden, uh, until the 1920s, was a very prosperous industrialized industrial city. As factory moved out from the city, the city became like decay, and they're struggling with the poverty and so on, and, and unemployment. So the government of New Jersey wanted to build something uh, big enough that can bring back the life, the so-called the economical activities back to the city. And New Jersey, we call New Jersey the Garden City. So what's the challenge of designing an aquarium in, in Camden? First, there's an existing city grid in the grid pattern, and then there's an existing urban park one. And then secondly, the visitor will go to the aquarium from New Jersey, which we call Garden City. They're going to approach the aquarium from the more like close-up view on a more human scale view. And secondly, there'll be like visitors traveling by boat from Philadelphia to the aquarium. So they are going to approach the building on a distance, on a different kind of scale, different kind of view. So how, how am I going to address this kind of urban, urban challenges and so on? Firstly, I decided that I shouldn't continue the city grid to the waterfront. I would leave the park open space as it is, and I would make the aquarium as a sculptural object in the park. This is the first uh, so-called idea I came up with. And then secondly, to address the earlier issue I mentioned to you, that there'll be like visitor coming to the aquarium from Philadelphia from a distance, so I had to make the, the the facade facing Philadelphia a bit more formal, more monumental. So it's from, from a distance, you can recognize the building. You can know this is an important building. And then from New Jersey side, people is, most of people is going to park the car and walk at a close-up, so I have to make it a bit more human scale. Since we call New Jersey a garden state, so I make it like almost like a small village as you walk through your like small pavilion, village setting, and so on. So this is the first approach something more formal versus something more organic, which uh, evidence in my school project. 
so this is the first thing. Third, how am I going to address the fairest switch, which is the most important switch? So I created an axis to connect fairest switch to the jetty, so that visitor from Philadelphia, when they come to the aquarium, they can 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 get up from the jetty, go to the aquarium. So this is a, another solution I think about. And then, as you can see, my perspective or drone better. There's an opening, uh, opening in this area. And then third or fourth, uh, in New Jersey, in this area, most of the residents they are African American. They are quite poor. They might not be able to buy the ticket to go in to view the apartment. So I don't want the building to be like to shut off itself from them. So I want to to make sure the building is a good neighbor building. So I created a lot of waterfront urban space so that the local can enjoy, can walk around, can use it as part of the, their everyday life. And then, so how, so this is a so-called urban design issue, the bigger issue I have to address as an architect, how to respond the building to the city uh, on a bigger scale. And then come to the design, the contents of the building itself. What is my storyline? How am I going to organize my activities? Uh, the exhibition, the main component of the exhibition for the aquarium is to, to showcase the aquatic life in New Jersey. So this is a, the purpose of the exhibition, to show people, to educate people about the aquatic life in New Jersey. How am I going to showcase it? I visited many aquariums throughout USA. Uh, most of them organize uh, the aquarium in a more so-called general way. You go to the aquarium, you can turn right, turn left, up to you. You pick. You can go anywhere you want. You feel like you're going to turn left, you go left. You want to enter right, you enter right. There's no, no so-called clear sequence and so on. But in this case, I want to tell a story. I want to tell a story in a more structural way, in a more linear way. So I use a so-called linear organization. After you purchase a ticket, you walk, you look at the outdoor exhibition, and then from the some very small exhibit, something very simple, way down to earth, and then story build up the excitement until the most important exhibit, which is the shark tank, which is the, the shark tank. This is the most important exhibit. Uh, I might want to talk to you a bit about the shark tank. We have a so-called expert to tell us how to design the aquarium and so on. And the shark tank had to be designed in a figure egg shape because the shark swim in egg shape, number egg shape and so on. And then after the shark tank, you go to the small exhibit and then you end up in the aquarium, in the auditorium to summarize your visit. So, so the whole thing is organized in a linear form. Introduction. The most important part, conclude and then conclusion in the auditorium. After that, you can go to bookstore and go to have a cup of coffee, or lunch or dinner. Or the study mall. This is the study mall. This is the actual building. It looks almost the same. Some of the, the interior shot of the, of the aquarium. The picture taken many, many years ago. It was just completed. <clears throat> I came back to Malaysia, and then in uh, December 1993, I joined BEP Architect. And then on, uh, I think, December 20th, 1990, uh, a few weeks later, I was asked by one of the directors say we have been invited at the last minute to design some kind of capital city. He did not know what was it. Since we are, I mean, he said you just do anything you want. He was not very sure. We only had three weeks to come out the proposal, and we did not have time to go to visit the site. And anyway, it, the site was not accessible. It was like palm oil plantation. So I just look at the map. I started the topo and so on. And, and then I look at two high points. I created an axis. Why? To me, as a capital city, you need certain formality, certain formality and so on. But as a living city, there will be thousands of people living in Putrajaya. You need certain organic elements. You need to have a neighborhood and so on. So it's something formal versus something more organic. It's almost like my schoolwork. I always have 
this thing about formality and organic. So this is the first sketch I have of Botraja. You have this uh, axis and so on. They are all the neighborhood, and then and then I pick up uh, I pick up a, a color pencil, uh, and then I thought, what should I do? And then I pick up a so called and then there are some river stream and so on. I pick up a to topography, so called to topography at about twenty two point five degree, and I cut them then with blue color. That's how the water come come up, come about. I remember, I remember I read an article about a little boy many, many years ago. And every time the teacher asked him to draw something, it's always in, in certain color, in black color, always in black color. And then the teacher was so concerned about him, so they consulted the psychiatrists and psychologists, and they did some kind of investigation on him, interviewed him and so on, what happened to him whether he has some kind of issue and so on. Eventually, he, they found out why he always used black color because he only had one type of color pencil. That's why he used black color. So in this case, why water? Because I happen to have a blue color pencil. So, so you see water in Potrasia, I mean, huh? so on. So you have something formal and something organic. And then from there, we produce uh, some simple drawings for presentation to the Prime Minister, Dr. Mahathir. And to me, Putrajaya had to be a garden city. When I mentioned garden city, I was influenced by Princeton, New Jersey, where I live for five years. In Princeton, the whole city is a garden. You don't have to go to garden anymore. That's why it's called garden. Everywhere is garden. You can walk around. So I thought Putrajaya should be a garden city. Government offices should be very simple. Everywhere is garden. When you go to Putrajaya, the building, the architecture should be secondary. The landscape should be more prominent, it means that the trees and everything should be more important than the building. That's my initial idea about Putrajaya. And then, as a Malaysia, as a democratic country, should be reflected in our architecture of Putrajaya. So in my mind, the building should be so simple that uh, there should be have a fish market in front of the Prime Minister's office, so the Prime Minister will go go to the fish market every day after work to buy fish and mingle with people like us. That's what I thought. Okay. The building should be so simple, like the building designed by Jeffrey Bauer in Sri Lanka. It's so simple, it's so, so down to us, so humble, that people like my mother, a farmer from Kuban, Rotan, they to walk in. But of course, this is not what happened today in Putrajaya. Today in Putrajaya, you feel like you have to wear a bow tie before you walk in. It's so intimidating. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about the architecture. So this was, this was the initial design of Potrajaya. And then we won a competition and I was appointed. Uh, I remember, the. I mean, it was a long story. Uh, when we pres uh, presented our work in the Prime Minister's office, the conference room, he walked around, he looked at my work and then he picked my work. It was very easy for him. So he, the Prime Minister, I was just standing next to him and then he picked my work to be the winner of the competition. So subsequently, I was appointed as a, chain, uh, as a chief designer in the consortium. And then we continue our design work for Putrajaya. Still the same thing, we have axis. We have uh, something formal where we have uh, five precincts, garment precincts, cultural precincts, commercial precincts, and so on. And this is a picture I took many, many years ago, Putrajaya. Uh, what I like about Putrajaya is the water, the water still there, because I thought uh, why people ask me why I like to have water, because I, in Malaysia, we have some of the most beautiful structure plan in the world because we follow the British system and so on. It, I remember it, many, many years uh, here in Kuala Lumpur, I read the structure plan, they say the Kuala Lumpur master plan, no building should be more than five story in Bangsa. Okay? And then there are a lot of open space and so on, but Due to certain factor and influence and so on, a developer come in, they can influence the mayor and the minister, Sunny, and open space become a shopping center. So I thought if I use water as the open space, it is very unlikely that they are going to build the shopping center in the future. <laughs> and then beside the water, also like cool down the environment by a few degrees. And then third, the water can be used uh, during the drought season 
as an emergency water supply to the people in Sangno. Of course, the architecture of the being uh, so-called very Islamic, I did not involve in any architecture design and so on. And then uh, in terms of the building to me, it's a bit monumental, a bit unfriendly, a bit inti intimidating. And in terms of the material use, it's a bit uh, not so-called not uh, sustainable. For so example, we're supposed to design a green city, but end up we use a lot of material that will reduce heat to the environment. But I love the water. And it's very nice, very, very clean, because why we use a filtration system to clean up the water, and then we use a seal trap on the bottom of the lake to make sure the water is always clean. This was a picture taken many, many years ago. Uh, when my son, Andrew, he was like, now he's 18 years old. Uh, my other son now is 20 years old. I think he, he must be like four or five years old. This is my Indonesian mate. Happened to be her name is Sri, so we just call her Puan Sri. My Indonesian mate. Anyway, now my children are in Seattle. Uh, my Indonesian mate moved back to Kalimantan, Tengah. My son started to work part time four years ago, when five years, three years ago, when he was 15 years old. The minimum pay in Seattle is $15 per hour, US $15 per hour, when you are 15 years old. So he makes some money. Every few months, he'll send the money to, to his kaka in Indonesia. Yeah. And in fact, uh, recently, uh, Kaka Sris just bought a piece of land. She asked me to design a, a house for her in Kalimantan. <laughs> <coughs> Uh, 10 meter by 6 meter, he, she gave me the dimension, two bedroom, one bath. Of course, I designed to be like rest up on steel to make sure it can be like, it will not be flooded and so on. And then my son was very worried, Andrew. He said, Papa, make sure you don't, are you going to design for her free of charge? He was so worried, I'm going to charge her a fee. <laughs> I said, don't worry, if I charge her, my fees will be a few times, a few times more than the construction cost. So it'll be free. It's going to be free. So. So this is Putrajaya. This, this project is in Kuala Lumpur. We call it KL Linear City. In KL, we have this Kering River. And then there's a so-called missing link in the transport and so on. Many years ago, uh, and then there are a lot of squatters along the river. There was a guy by the name of David Chiu. He was the so-called MIT trans transport engineer. The guy, uh, he was approached by the city hall to ask him to, to help to solve the parking problem in KL and also the squatters problem and so on. So he began to look into the, the so-called 12 kilometer Kring River, Sungai Kring, and so on. You can see the squatters and so on. Initially, it was supposed to be like to build some multi-story parking and so on. But he looked at it, that their, their opportunity to clean up the river and then to build some commercial or residential uh, buildings along it or above the river. That's how the idea of KL Linear City come about. <coughs> and along the 12 kilometer, we have different, different kind of parcel. They have certain parcels more like for residential, certain parcel like commercial, certain parcel mixed, mixed development. And certain parcel is very small. We just have a building spent across the river and then to be supported by Monoria, KL Monoria. Some then just like, a very simple building with cafe and so on, and then for tourists. And again, to be connected by pedestrian walkway and then also the monorail. And among all passes, the most important, the biggest is, is called Giga World. Giga is, is uh, bigger than Mega. During the 1998, 2000, everyone wanted to build the biggest building in the world, the longest building in the world. So this was the longest building in the world. Two point, I think 2.8 kilometers long, supposed to be the longest building in the world. And it was to be built above the Crane River uh, near KL Central. And we are not allowed to put any column in the river due to the hydraulic reason. So we engaged a structure engineer by the name of Anthony Hunt from England to design a structure for us, it's like almost like he used a so-called transfer concept 
it's almost like you put a, a table over the long gun and then you put a, something above it. So it's the same kind of concept. The project was not implemented due to the financial crisis in 1998. And another project as part of the KL University is, uh, was like near KLCC and next to Kampong Baru. My concept was to how to use a public building as a connector to connect the Golden Triangle and Kampong Baru. To, to me, uh, architecture and urban design is a social science. Whenever I have a chance to, to design a grouping of building, I try to use a building to encourage social activities. In this case, the most important part of building is a big piazza in between two parts of the cities. The rich Bukit Bintang, uh, so-called Golden Triangle, and the poor Kampong Baru Marais Reserve. I try to have something to connect them together with a big urban space and a cultural space and museum and so on. Today, I'm going to talk to you about just a general idea. I'm not going to go to architecture detail. If I want to go to architecture detail, I think you guys have to stay here until tomorrow morning. <laughs> so I just go for that. So if this is a, something general between uh, a conversation between a tall, because in, in the so-called in the Golden Triangle side, the land is very expensive. It to be tall, it to be high density. And a conversation between the tall building for the very rich people to the people in Kampong Baru, how we can use a building as a bridge to connect two together and so on. And monorail. Yeah. I designed 11 monorail station. Nothing to shout about. It's just like it's to bring people from one part of the city to another. Mm. In uh, 1998, I came out, I set up a company with my, my brother 20 years ago <coughs> called Akunim Architect. The first project we got was for, for Tan Sri Ling Kim Hong of ICT. He owned this way old house very old, near KLCC. The ex I mean, it was in a very poor condition. This is a basement with all his uh, picture of himself, cover, in the, I mean, the magazine and so on. And then later I found out all tycoon, their published magazine, they actually had to pay for it. They had to buy thousands of books. So I feel very bad. I feel very good because why? I have a lot of publicity. I don't have to pay for it. I mean, newspaper give me two pages, three pages, and so on. So that's why I saw this Tan Sri Lim Kim Hong, the tycoon, and so on. And as you walk in, the assistant building is something like this. There's a staircase. And, uh, and then I was very excited when he called me. He said he wanted to design, want me to design his corporate headquarters. I assume it's going to be a 60-story building with a maybe 500 million ringgit budget. So I was very excited. When I went to see him, he told me, say, Kun Lim, my budget is only half a million, 500,000. But I want you to design something that when people come in, they feel like it is a 5 million ringgit design. <laughs> he asked me. And then I was a bit confused. I said, how? And then he, he mentioned to me that he said, look, he looked at me. I'm a rich person, very rich. So people assume my all the shirt I, I wear must be super expensive, but actually all the shirt I, I bought it for five ringgit in Shanghai <laughs> and so on. And then my secretary, Miss uh, Su Cheng, bought me a suspender, 20 rolls, and I put in my suspender, 20 rolls plus five rolls, suddenly become 500 rolls. Like, look, wow, so expensive looking. So can I do something like that? <laughs> so there was his design brief to me, a five million dollars budget, but it looked like, I know, five, half a million, but the final products have to look like it is five million. So I begin my design process. I started the existing drawings and so on. And the color one is a new new portion. So the basement, I mean, we come in, uh, uh, we, we have a so-called, I took out a staircase, I removed, put a staircase here. The staircase become a connector to connect the upper floor to the basement and to bring the natural light in. And then, and then I decided that to, the cheapest way to build his own room is to, to build something above the roof, existing roof. And then to make the roof, to make the building, his room appear bigger, I decided to use something that's like curvy linear. I remember many, many years ago, I read an article about IMP's uh, so-called uh, theater in 
text us. They asked him, Mr. Pei, why you love to use curvilinear or circular shape or form in your building? He said, when you have a circular shape or curvilinear, curvilinear space, it will give you multiple points perspective so that the space will appear bigger. So that's the reason why I decided to use curve for his own office space. And then I know Malaysian love number H. So if I design his office space like number H, he will never say no. So true enough, he approved immediately. So this, this uh, as you enter, we move the staircase here, so it becomes a like very nice building. And the basement becomes like very airy. And the existing building, which is something more rigid, more formal, contrasts with the new, new addition, which is something more organic. And his office space. And so on. It's a small building, but a pretty way big. Yeah, actually, I have a lot of story about Lim Kim Hong, but I think I should continue. <laughs> See, it was our first project, small building, half a million, and and uh, I should thank him, even he was a very lousy paymaster. I should thank him. He gave me such a challenge that we produced quite a nice building. It was featured in many international magazines. But subsequently, I decided that I don't want to be his consultant anymore. <laughs> because I told him, because I, my last payment, uh, when uh, he owed me some money. So when I asked for my last payment, his accountant asked me to bring a check to pay them. So I wonder what was going on. ICT, uh, they bought all Sanyo, and then they also like, end up they also like produce like I, uh, laptop and so on, all manufactured in China. So their first laptop just shipped in from China. So I was supposed to be their first customer. And then they owe me certain amount of money, but the laptop cost more than the man, amounts they owe me. So they want me to pay for the difference. So, <laughs> so subsequently he asked me to design more projects for him. I said, no, thank you very much. He said, why? I said, look, I just want to be an architect. If I design the bigger building for you, my fee will be much bigger. And now I have to set up a shop to sell your product. I have to sell your Acon, TV, computer, and so on. So this was my first project on my own. Something formal and organic. Uh, a house I designed many years ago. In country as Lamansara, on a sloping side, normally I don't want to cut and fill. I try to respond to the existing topography. So on the higher ground, I have two-story building, lower, three-story. And I call this modern interpretation of Kampong House. So I try to encourage cross ventilation throughout the building. As you can see on the ground floor, it's very open, cross ventilation with a swimming pool to cool down the first left above. And we have a lot of secondary skin to provide shelter, uh, so-called, to provide uh, protection from the harsh sunlight and a series of balcony as well. In our section, showing the cross ventilation, second layer skin. We also keep, keep a few uh, trees, existing trees on site. And this is a so called, uh, so called two generation, three generation building. The parent, uh, the, the, the owner, uh, husband and wife, and his children and their chil children all live together. Swimming pool, cool out of sleep above. A lot of sec, uh, sun shading, second layers of skin. As you enter, we have a so called fish pond. You can go through. And big open space, di dining on the right hand side and then living room, but separated by the double volume foyer. And I also create a lot of so called double volume space to separate. Uh, 
also serve as a buffer between the hot, harsh sun and so on. And you also use it as a so-called vertical connection. A example, the grandmother can shout to their grandchildren to come out for, for dinner. So this is almost like, it's a section, so-called section, uh, vertical volume, and then they can use it to connect people on the upper floor and lower floor together. A lot of so-called uh, uh, indirect sunlight, uh, wind tunnel effects, cross ventilation to encourage uh, wind flow and so on. Uh, one of the existing tree that we keep on site. A few years ago, Train Magazine of, I think, Australia, New Zealand, selected this building, this house, as the best single family or bungalow in Malaysia over a period of 20 years. It was a very simple building, simple house, with a very simple idea. The idea of how to responsive to the tropical environment, the idea of how to uh, interpret the house as a modern kampong house. Uh, so far, I only designed three houses in my life. This is the third house I ever designed. A, a couple called me up. They asked. They said they want to want me to design a house uh, in Seremban. I went to see them in Seremban, and she drove a very old car, very run out car, and so on. So in my mind, I wonder whether they have money to pay me. Yeah. I did not know they are so rich, very humble. And they took me to this big, big site and so on, beautiful site surrounded by trees at the back. So anyway, I gave them a benefit of the doubt. I emailed them my fee proposal. Normally, I asked for a lot of down payment. So a week later, they called me in. I met them in Suleiman, uh, in the, one of the, uh, I think maybe a Starbucks or uh, Berry Funds, I forgot. And I was like, I was uh, waiting for them. And I read the Star newspaper. And then they came, came in, they gave me a check. I checked my name, make sure it's like, spell correctly, my down payment. And then they, they asked me, Mr. Kunim, what do you have in mind for my house? So I just sketched out this in, in three minutes. I said, your house should be like this. First of all, the view at the back is very important. Secondly, we don't want to have any cut and feel because of slope. Third, the approach to the house is very important. Uh, we want the house to be like almost like surrounded by landscape garden. And then in most of the big houses in Malaysia, when you go to a house, you have a very so-called expensive foyer, in, uh, indoor foyer, big light and so on. But in this house, the negative space become positive. You come in, actually it's an open space, like almost like Sarambi. As you come in, you see the garden, you see the whole landscape, the whole environment. So I created an axis to organize a house. And they say it's okay. They, they like it. This was my concept like in a few minutes, just like Potraja, a few minutes. And they agree. And then I sketch out a bit nicer with office and so on. And then my staff begin to draw in the computer. And then we design, we submit, we never change anything. In my life as an architect, I design with intuition. If the client pick my first sketch, the building will always turn out to be very nice. If they change it, it will be like something going wrong some way. See, because why? I believe in intuition. Uh, uh, people ask me how I design building, where I get the inspiration. I say I get the inspiration from the site. Everything on, is on the site. You go to the site, it's like very natural. They say how. And then I, I, I ask them, I think there was an interview by Sinchu many years ago. I said, look, uh, I told the journalist, do you watch a, there's a TV radio show about dog called Dog Whisperer. There was a guy by, him, by the name of Cesar Milan in USA. He is a dog trainer. No matter what kind of dog you have, what kind of problem you, the dog has, he touch a dog, the dog will calm down. He can talk to the dog. So I told him, the only thing I know, my only skill is I can talk to the environment. I can talk to the trees, 
and the ground and the earth. I asked them what they want, so they told me what they want. So this is my inspiration, so I can talk to the environment. Stopping site, no current field. The only requirement my client gave me was, he told me, uh, he, he has uh, this eight columns, 22 feet, stored in his warehouse in Sabah. The owner was the biggest pool manufacturer in the world. He owns factory in Ohio, in LA, in Vietnam, in Malaysia. See? So he said his friend gave him as a gift, eggs of them. So it's the only thing that he wanted me to incorporate in his design. The rest is all up to me. So you can see the egg column. And the building was designed for like, for in terms of so-called guidelines we use, it's like for maybe up to like go uh, green design index, building design index and so on. We use a so-called uh, paved grass so that the water can seep through and so on, the solar panel. As you, uh, your first view of the building is this vista. You can see the pavilion. You can see the so-called all the trees behind. <coughs> so the house is about the environment. When you enter the house, you see the environment, you see the pool, you see a tree, you don't see the expensive foyer with the expensive lighting and the furniture. Again, I use a so-called circular shape to make the space appear bigger. The most uh, important part of the house is the kitchen. The, the husband loves to, to cook, so the kitchen is like 2,000 plus square feet. It's a big kitchen. And a lot of indirect light. This is his home office. And beside the house, we designed, when we just set up, we designed a lot of showrooms and 3S center for Toyota and Lexus. This is for Lexus. We, des we started out to design this at a lot of showrooms for Toyota. Toyota. Toyota is like more like medium price. So the showroom had to be a bit loud, have a big roof and so on. And then for Lexus, they said Lexus had to be understatement, simple, but expensive understatement. So the design is very simple. Uh, this is a so-called the rim to the uh, to the car park, multi-story car park. <coughs> uh, many years ago, I was invited by a, a big corporation, as the architect and city planner, to design a city to the government of India. They are bidding for the land to build a city. Uh, there are a few other big corporation shortlisted or engage some of the biggest firm in the world to participate in the design. It is in Hoso in Tamil Nadu. The project is going to be called like Hoso Eco City. I visited the site and there was a, a big challenge. The site is divided into two parts and then to make it worse, it was like uh, cut through by the an existing railway line. So to the owner, they don't know what to do with it. To their in-house team, they think like it is, it is a, a treasury. They don't know how to connect the two pieces of land together. But to me, whenever there's a, a challenge, there's always an opportunity, just like the Chinese word, Weiji, when there's something dangerous, so always an opportunity. And I, when there's a railway line, you must have a green buffer. So I told myself how maybe I can use a, railway line as a connector to connect both sides of the derivatives together. <clears throat> as usual, I come up my with rough sketch, uh, rough sketch and so on, uh, to show how the concept can work together. And I remember uh, the guy who hired me is a big uh, uh, hire me. Uh, they already come out of scheme. It was rejected by the owner. So we have a meeting in the conference room. I sketch up this one, sketch up this scheme and so on. Something like, I think the kindergarten student can draw much better. 
So he was very worried when the chief advisor to the big boss, uh, GM, GM Rao came in, look at my drone, they are so scared. He was so quiet. They thought we will be fired. Why can Kun Lim produce this stupid sketch? And so on. And then suddenly this guy picked up a call. He called his big boss, a billionaire, GM Rao. He said, look, uh, Mr. Rao, now I'm in uh, CPG's office in Bangalore, India. Mr. Kun Lim is in front of me. Mr. Pan is in front of me. And then I look at Mr. Kunim's initial sketch. I feel very good. It's make a, com a complicated project look so simple. So this is a sketch. From this sketch, we turn into a, a city. And the police drawings. It is, and the green spine become a connector to the entire city. Under the green spine, you have all the fiber optics, you have all the infrastructure. And when, when, the, when the people have to cross the green spine, they, they will just have to provide the underpass tunnel for them to cross. Or, or overhead bridge. So the green become a connector of the city. We won a competition. We beat. Uh, all the big firm from USA and Hong Kong. But unfortunately, due to political reason, they are unable to acquire the land. Nothing built up until now. And this is another project I involved in nine years ago in Shenyang. I was asked by a big corporation from Malaysia to come out a master plan to acquire this piece of land in Shenyang. And of course, they want to demolish all the existing building. I said, no, you have to keep it. Why? They are like existing malls and building and so on. And I told them, look, you want to they, they told me they are going to relocate the people who live here to another city. But I say yes, you can relocate them, but who is going to work there? Uh, I mean, they want to move them here. These people, who is going to work in a five-star hotel and big office building and so on, the people who live there, eventually is going to work in a five-star hotel. So we have to keep something that is uh, sentimental to them. So they have certain emotional attachment. So I insisted that they have to keep the existing malls. Uh, this is a so-called assistant mosque, which I we decided to keep. And as usual, I came out my three minute sketch and so on. So the mosque supposed to be a, something negative to them. I turned into a big, I turned into the focus, main focus of the whole development surrounded by Raza. And from there, we did up the drawings and so on and turn into our so-called urban design with the, I mean, we have this assistant mosque with a, a sunken plaza in front, so that we have, have a conversation between new and old. New and old coexist together. We presented the scheme to the governor of Shenyang and uh, the only province. Uh, my client won the bid to do something there, but they are unable to raise enough fund. <clears throat> Since 2005, I began to work on projects in Indonesia. The first one was in a city called Lipo Chikalang. Uh, all the black and white portion are already built, so I was asked to remaster the, the one in color. So the first one I was asked to remaster plan this area and turn into the new city center. And Again, the assistant malls, I, I kept, I asked them to keep it. And assistant village, same thing. I told them, the people who used to live here, they are going to come back to work for your five-star hotel and so on. We need to keep something sentimental to them. And what's the storyline about this city? The spine, the connector, the water. Since uh, we need the so-called water detention pond, uh, on-site detention for flood mitigation, so I created a linear lake to be a connector to connect the residential, re, res, residential area to the commercial area. So when you live here, you can either cycle to work or you take, take a boat to go to work, or you can walk. The city is under construction. I was there last week. This is another project also in Lipo Chikalang. Same thing, they wanted to build 
a conventional shopping center, I said no. Because there are existing houses and so on, I want to keep it. And there are also existing trees, I want to keep it. So the existing tree was my concept, was my inspiration. All the darker color are existing tree. So in certain area where they have a cluster existing tree, it becomes my main focus, become a courtyard. And then in certain area, when there's a nice existing tree, we introduce like restaurants and cafe next to it. So you create an instant ambience to the shopping uh, area. It was completed many years ago. And in between two wings of the so-called the, the street mall, we have this uh, big open space. We can use it as an urban connector and we can use it for certain activities like when you want to launch a new car and so on. Construction. Last week I went to Jakarta. I visited four, four more four pieces and then I have four more projects in Indonesia. And uh, I was there for three days and then this week at first I thought I want to I have my so called schedule all, all lined up for Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. Sunday all the weekend my clients in Jakarta call me, say they are coming to see me in Malaysia on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday I took travel to Singapore with them. I mess up all my schedule. And then they say they'll be in KL at the hotel at 8 a.m. They want them to, to go to visit some nice place with them, like so-called study trip. And then ask me, what am I going to take them between 8 to 12? So I told them I have a dentist appointment between 10.30 to 11.30. <laughs> so between 10.30 and 11.30, they waited in the, for me in my, at the dental clinic, dentist clinic. So, most of my clients become my friends. Yeah, most of them. Especially those who pay me in time, on time. <laughs> they always become my very good friends. <laughs> so, this is another project in India. Same thing. You have a problem on site. You have a monsoon rain. They don't know what to do with it. And then the same. As usual, they want to, to build a, a grouping of building. To me, when you want to build a grouping of building, the space in between buildings are more important than the building. Means that the inter, uh, means that the social space in between buildings are more important. We should use the opportunity to design a space to encourage interaction. The building should be secondary; shouldn't be so prominent. And and in this case, I decided to use a linear spine to connect the whole thing together. Along the linear spine, there are like entrance, like guard house, gymnasium, cafe, and so on. And then the first grouping of building is for the chairman, the corporate of building. So I decided to design something that's more formal with a big courtyard with a roof above it so that you can use it for assembly to watch cricket match live and so on. And the second, and the second grouping is more informal because it is for young scientists uh, to work, their office, and so on. So I created a lot of more informal, interactive space for them to discuss and so on. Uh, in, I remember when Louis Kahn was asked to design a sort institute in San Diego, San, uh, La Jolla, I, went to, I visited the space, I think the building a few years ago. He said, they asked him why he had a lot of leftover space. He said, those are not leftover space, those are positive space. Those are chance space, interactive space to encourage interactions. Just imagine, he say, when a, a scientist, when, when he want to walk to the restroom, the toilet, on the way there, he bump into his friend, and he sit down, there's a nice piazza, with a bench, he sit down, and then he discuss about certain issue. Sometimes they can come up some very good idea. That's why it's called time space, to encourage interaction. So this is a concept I have, time space. And then this is a dormitory for the workers. So you have three different components all linked together by a spine, the so-called linear connector, which shown up in many of my projects. <clears throat> I'll just go through very fast.
the first one was built, but they do not follow, follow my design exactly. They ate a lot of funding elements. So I don't want to show you guys that it was built. It was completed. This this building is com uh, the first block, first parcel was like completed many years ago. And I also designed a series building for PKT, uh, Dato Michael Teo. In uh, this one's in Shahalam. He liked to use uh, when we, the first one, his corporate headquarters. We call the ship and then the wave and so on, and the, the large house. PKT. Uh, I mean, it's a so-called Facebook compulsory company. Everybody must have a Facebook account. They manage, uh, the reason why I use Facebook because of I'm his consultant. So I must have Facebook account. They manage the, the business by Facebook. Even the secure card must have a Facebook account. Uh, so they know what's going on. So this is uh, the, the first group, group, uh, group in the building, his headquarters. In his building, he has a lot of uh, facilities such as restaurants, Gymnasium, spa, and so on. Uh, warehouse. Uh, this is his uh, vertical warehouse and his college and his entertainment hub inside there, like Japanese garden, spa, restaurants. It's all up here. And uh, this is the project. Um, it's ongoing in Batukawan. As you pass by the second bridge, the toy, you can see this one, he called it the Chua Wave, which I, I went there yesterday. Huh? I mean, this, uh, this picture was taken two years ago. And next to the Chua Wave, uh, we, we have the longest Japanese garden. This is the longest warehouse in Malaysia with the longest Japanese garden. The, the Chua Wave. Next to the Chua Wave is a university which is under construction. And then near the university, there are some commercial hub and also a museum, which I, I'm going to design for him soon. And I'm, I'm supposed to go back to, to KL tomorrow and then go back to Seattle. He just called me. He told me I have to come back to Penang on Monday for, for presentation to the government. On, on, I, I don't know what he want me to present to. He said they're going to prepare everything. So I have to come back to Penang on Monday. And uh, this is a project in India, in Darawi. Darawi is the biggest slum in the world. Hmm. You watch a movie, Slumdog Millionaire, which won the best Oscar for foreign movie. It was based on the story in Darawi. Hmm. It is like poor and dirty, but I like it in terms of when as an architect and urban designer, we talk about urban fabric. Uh, it is very, very lively. You live there, you work there, and so on. Uh, so the 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 design was I was asked because it is near the town center, so it is very expensive as far as the land value is concerned. So I was asked to to design the public housing for the people who live there, and then the level space we are going to turn into the market condominium and shopping center and hotel. And then in the neighborhood, there are a lot of existing masjid and church and Hindu temple. I was asked to, to demolish it and then just like erase them from history like nothing happened. But I said no. I said those are important parts of the, 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 the history. We cannot erase it. In fact, I want to make it more important. So I propose to use a linear so-called walkway, linear path to connect all those buildings together, the masjid, the Hindu temple, and the church together. And then I also study the measure, so-called intersection, the pedestrian route, and so on. And then I also study the urban pattern, with how these people go together, which area should turn into a public space, which should be a semi-public and private. And then we are asked to design public housing to relocate these people where they live, where they used to live uh, with a so-called 24-hour lifestyle to their apartment. When you look at all the public housing all the world, it was always a failure. Uh, crime, uh, I, mean, I mean, it's like infected with crime, drug, and so on. Why? Because it was a 
always designed as a single use, uh, so called single use uh, building type or development type single use. This means that it is only for as a design as a residential. During the daytime, when parents go to work, nobody look after the children, then they tend to involve in all kinds of activities, uh, not so design activities, and then drug pusher will go in to sell drugs and so on. So to me, for public housing, it has to be it has to be so-called a 24 hours development. This means that in a cluster, I might have a few hundred units of houses for two to three thousand people to live there, but also incorporate public markets, parking and recreation facilities. I also have a school and shops. When the parents go to work somewhere else, the teachers, the shopkeeper can keep an eye. So that the so-called criminals have to think twice if they want to sell the drug or and so on in the area. That's what architecture is not just design building. You have to think about how can you use architecture to deter certain activities. How can you use architecture? Example, when you design a row of show houses, you can decide that the corner lot should be a 24 hours like restaurant and so on. So they serve as a so-called like security to deter certain criminal activities. Just like <clears throat> when you are yeah, in Malaysia, You've seen a lot of so-called stadium. Ninety percent of the time, it was like it was like empty. Nobody used it because it's like designed as a single use. How to go about it? I have ideas. Uh, I mean, the I have I have ideas. Uh, if the sport and youth ministry they approach me, I have a lot of ideas for them how to do it. It had to be a multiple usage so that you encourage multiple activities. Uh, example, when you go to the Batukawan, the stadium, just for soccer, so 10% of the time it was occupied, 90% it was empty. In France, it's always a big open space, open parking. So why don't we design something like under the sit sitting, we have some shops, and then in the open space, we design one multi-story parking to solve the parking problem. On the right-hand side, you can have a multi-story indoor activity space. You have a rock climbing, you have an indoor soccer, you can have shops, you can have a Post office, you have a clinic, you have a cafe. And then you also have a, some kind of street mall. So it's during weekend when the father sends the son to go to learn how to, 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 to learn fencing and so on. He can wait there with a cup of coffee and can read his newspaper and so on. And then to, to do so, you also can encourage a racial in, integration. Uh, Malay might like to play soccer, Chinese might want to play badminton, all of them will be together in the so-called common public space to have coffee together in the same space. That's what it should be. So there's a reason why any such activity should be like designed as a multi-use space. It shouldn't be just a sport complex, it should be a community center, it should be a library, and so on. I'll show you an example that I'm doing right now in KL, which is under construction. So this is what we have in Darawi. To a lot of people, this is a this is poor, uh, the poverty, dirty and poor and so on. To me, this is very interesting. You have a, a sense of so-called uh, like life activities, urban fabric and so on. You watch a uh, so-called movie, Slumlord Millionaire, you know about the story about what happened with the Muslim boy. Uh, his family, like, they are like killed during the riot. He had to escape from Darawi and so on. And then uh, the composer in the movie, Abdul Rahman, he, was, uh, he happened to be one of the re residents. He was a Muslim. And when he, he won the the best composer award in the Oscar. He was asked to receive the award. He said, as the resident of Darawi during that time, during the incident, he has a choice. All my life, I have a choice of hate and love. I choose love. That's why he's there. He was there to receive an award. Instead of choose uh, hatred, he chose love, choose uh, forgiving and so on. So when we talk about love, forgiving and compassion, I want to talk to you about my next project and about the person which I admire a lot, which is Master Chen Yen of uh, Church Foundation. <clears throat> Many years ago, 
I think in the year 2005, I was a so-called up-and-coming architect. I've been invited to give lectures all the country, all the world. And usually I was paid a lot of money to give lecture. I don't mind to share with you some lecture. I was paid like 5,000 US for one lecture. Uh, you don't have to worry. Uh, just give me a few, a few pieces of your furniture later. <laughs> uh, she's very worried now. Uh, so I was given a lot of money to give lecture. So one day, my brother, um, I mean, before, uh, before I went to, to see Suji a few years ago, my, my brother came back to Malaysia. Uh, he talked to me about he's going to move to a new hospital called uh, Suji Sintian Hospital. He mentioned to me that I must go to visit his hospital. It was very beautiful, designed with a sky garden, and people play piano and so on. So I wonder what kind of hospital was that. And then, and then I told myself why he wanted to change to a new hospital. Uh, most likely, they increased his paycheck. Before that, he was head of the Chang'an Hospital in, in uh, near, near the airport. He was highly paid. He was like, considered one of the top doctors in Taiwan. So I thought he must be got, uh, pay a lot to move to, to a new hospital, and he's a Catholic. And then one day I talked to my sister. I said, oh, uh, my brother, he moved to the Suji hospital. He must be making a lot of money now. And then my sister said, no, the other way around. He, Suji paid him half of what he used to get. So I was very curious, who is Suji? What is Suji? And then a few months later, my brother called me. He was having lunch with Master Chen Yen. And together with Suji International Director, Stephen Huang. And uh, Stephen Wang mentioned to them that he just came back from Malaysia. He saw certain building. And then he told him he liked the building. And my brother told them that I was the architect. And Master Chen Yen said, asked my brother to invite me to go to Taiwan. And my brother asked me, asked me to go to Taiwan two days later. And I asked him, who is going to pay for my flight and my hotel and my time? So my brother was very angry. He said, I pay for you. Don't worry, you come over. So I was really wonder why they want to, me to go to, to Taiwan. So in my mind, Suji must be extremely poor. Their building must be like, I mean, like in a way poor condition, run down and so on, with the water leaking from the roof. <laughs> there was what I have in mind. And then anyway, I went to Taiwan. I have no choice. My brother asked me to go. I went to Taiwan. And they say somebody is going to come to the airport to pick me up. And the uh, Lo Sensen, uh, Lo Sisyong, and this guy came to pick me up with a beautiful Mercedes Sports. And I said, wow, oh, Shi <laughs> 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 It's not what I think. Uh, they, <laughs> and then I went, the first building I went to was in a building in uh, Ban Chiao. It was a very, very beautiful building with a lot of greenery and so on. At first I thought it must be so this headquarters, and then I found later it was just one of their buildings. And then I was asked, they, once I arrived there, Ms. Huang Sisen invited me to the big auditorium with thousands plus of people. And I saw this nun, which, is Master, which was Master Chen Yan. She talked in a way, calm way, in a mix of Taiwanese and Mandarin. And instantly I was attracted to her. She was so calm. But I still did not know who, who was she. In fact, before I went to Taiwan, I asked my brother, how should I ad address Master Chen Yen? Should I call her Sang Ren Xiao Jie? My brother said, no, just call her Sang Ren. <laughs> I did not know. So, so anyway, I was invited to go to the room to discuss with, to talk to her after her talk. I did not know who he, she was. I, like, I was joking with her all the time. So people were, were very surprised. After our so-called discussion and conversation, I was asked to be in the same car, same car SUV, MPV with her. As the car left the complex, the city complex, I saw hundreds of people all wave to her and they cry. <laughs> so, so, so in my mind, this she must be some somebody important. So that's my first encounter with Master Chen Yen, and then all, and then in my first trip to Taiwan, all three days I meet him, three, meet her three times. And then from Master Chen Yen, I learned about Suji. I learned about their philosophy. For Master Chen Yen, Suji 
Sushi Center or Sushi Campus is a, a place for you to learn, to be compassionate, to, to have empathy, to help people. It's a, it's a so-called educational institution. So for you to learn something new, the building should be very simple, uh, very, with a very simple neutral color, natural color, and so on, uh, so that it can be calm. To Master Chen Yen, building is a teacher in silence, Wu Shen Shuo Fa, Wu Shen Lao Shi. Appearance can influence a person. Uh, that's what she believed in. That's what all social building is very simple. And then the building must reflect the roots of its original purpose. So all the social building, you must have a zhen zhe pang because it's for people. And secondly, all the buildings of social building have to reflect Taiwanese architecture because it is originally from Taiwan. So you have to reflect the history of the of the foundation, of Shishi Foundation. And then to her, in front of the building, you must have a lot of green space, open space, because she believed if, if you go to a building in front is a big, nice open space, it will influence you to be, have an open heart, but to be like Xin Song Kwa Ta, to be, to be like more generous and so on. And then also to her, Anyway, they refer to Master Chen Yen as him. I don't know why. They don't say she, they say him, Master Chen Yen. So to him, a public building must have a clear entrance. Where is the main entrance? Where is the side entrance, secondary entrance, and so on? Why? Because she wants a student, when they go to the school, like instance, this is an international school designed by SOM from the USA. The student must recognize the main entrance instantly. They know this is the main entrance, so they go in. Because she does want students always have to look for entrance, always have to go home, and so that when they grow up, you always go home. And that's what she believes a good building can influence a person, can shape a person's character. A building is a teacher in silence. That's what she believes in. And then she also believes that a building should be a good neighbor. We should welcome the neighbor to come in, should be way open. So that's what I learned about her philosophy because when they asked me to help them to design their campus, I read a lot of books about her, about Shiji, so I know the philosophy. So if I want to design a building, it was very easy for me because I, don't, I, I cannot design for me, I'm designed for Shiji, so it was very easy. And as you know, Shiji helped out to, uh, in the disaster, natural disaster all over. Like in this instance, they built school for the Muslim in Iran. They built school for the uh, people in uh, Sri Lanka, in Banda Aceh, in Jakarta, and so on. And they also have their so-called green design guideline. To, 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 to Master Chen Yen, our earth, our environment is just like human. When, when you build a highway to cut through a mountain, just like you use a knife to cut off your skin, so it, it is very painful. So you have to do something to, to put it back, to be in so-called in balance with or in harmony with the existing environment. In all the school, uh, Suji building, all the so-called pavement had to be, we had to use interlocking pavement so the water can seep through to, to her or to him. The, the earth is a human being, must be able to breathe. And with a lot of natural ventilation as well. And then to Master Chen Yen, before we are allowed to discharge the water to the public sewage system, it to be like filter, make sure it's clean, and so on. There's some of the uh, so-called architecture or green architecture philosophy I learned by working with Sushi Foundation. And some of them I visited. And I went to Hualien. I met Master Chen Yen maybe 15 to 20 times over the course of five years. My first project was to design remastering their campus in San Dimas, California. And then a Shiji volunteer bought a piece of land, donated to Shiji in Kapong. So I began to design the building for Shiji. Even I know her requirement, but as an architect with ego, I still want to initially had my imprint in the design. 
So I know the most important variable is the Jiang Jin Tang had to be symmetrical. I said, it's okay. I designed something that's very symmetrical with a Zhen Zibang for, for Chelsea. But at the back, I want to have my architecture star, my signature. So I came out something like this. Of course, it was like, he did not say he, no or yes, but from her expression, I know he, she disapproved it. So subsequently, I came out the design she liked. And I went to see her again. And it was approved instantly. <laughs> with, with Master Chen Yen, I, I, I always, whenever I go to see her, I get my staff to draw, to build a lot of starry models so it can open up in layers. And I have to show her where's the basement car park and court and so on. So it was very easy for her to understand. We came up many versions of the facade design. The, the, the main concept was three buildings, the most important building in the mirror, the two buildings on the side is like the hand hugging you. It's like Yong Pao Chang Sen hug you, like a good neighbor building to welcome you. And then in between the building, they have transitional space. I turn into like semi-open space with a lot of natural light, natural ventilation, and so on. You can see a lot of cross ventilation, light wheel. So it's like a building that can breathe. Because to, to, to people in Suzhi, Suzhi is like a, a, a lantern to guide you. And then uh, to Suzhi, to let to be free, you to be, be able to let go of your hatred, your anger, your greed, and your ego. So you can, can be free like a bird in the sky. Uh, this is the Suzhi building today in KL. Three buildings, the middle one in the middle, I set back, and then with a so called semi open transitional space. And I want to encourage people not to use the elevator, the lift, so we use a ramp for them to walk up. And we have exhibition along the ramp as well. Lots of natural light in the in between space, transitional space. I mean, Shuzi is a, probably the most incredible foundation of Chinese so-called uh, organization in the Chinese world I will come across. I'm a Catholic, but I'm, I'm very inspired by Master Chen Yen. I met all kinds of people in the world. I met like, Mahathir maybe 20 times. I met Master Chen Yen. I met leader in India. I met uh, President Jimmy Carter many years ago, but nobody is like Master Chen Yen. <clears throat> uh, i just give one example. I met him many times, I never see him ever get angry. I remember when I was a so-called practicing architect full-time in KL, there are many times we produced beautiful drawings for Toyota. Toyota had to go through many layers of approval, first test by the so-called project manager, second test by end user, third the managing director. There was a time we designed something, to me it was fantastic, every approved, come to the managing director, Maybe he has a big fight with the wife the night before. It was a beautiful drone approved by everybody, but he was very angry. He banged the table, he walked out. So, but with Master Chen, I've seen her so many times, she never get angry. Uh, this one uh, instance, we went there for a meeting. There were architects from all over to come to brief her. I was the first architect to brief her. We finished our presentation. The people from Malaysia were asked to leave the room. She asked me to stay next to her to advise her and so on. And I saw this young architect. Maybe she, sometimes when you, you learn too much, you can be like, so <laughs> what So she, she interprets Shishi philosophy too literally until like, so <laughs> And then I look at other Shishi committee, they are so impatient, they are very angry. But Master Chen Yen was so calm, so we talked to him and so on, and guide him. She was not angry at all. So I was so impressed you know, that she has so much Compassion. That, that is like not normally found in people like us. Yeah. So the next one is about the UCSI University new campus in Suraman. 
Same thing, I was asked to design their new campus and the new medical school and hospital. And I look at the site, north-south orientation, and I try to respond to the existing ground topography with a parking tuck on the slope so that you can use a, take advantage of the natural light. You don't have to use a so-called mechanical ventilation system and so on. And as usual, it was my first sketch, 25th May 2009. And from there, we turned to master plan. So it was very easy. Because Dato Peter, he, he loved it, he never changed. So it was very easy. The campus, the medical school, and hospital. And the, the, the medical school, we introduced a lot of so-called natural ventilation, a lot of sky gardens and so on to encourage interactions. So, I mean, we introduced the sky garden as a so-called chance or accidental space. Construction started many years ago, phase one completed, but I don't have the latest photograph. And <clears throat> many years ago, somebody called me, said, Dato New Suket want to see me. A tall, good looking guy want to see me. I went to see him. I, he said, Mr. Kuni, can you rec uh, recognize me? Remember, I said, Yeah, 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 because I cannot say no. <laughs> because he's a big time developer. He was a very nice guy. I'm going to see him again next week. He said, I worked for you before as a trainee. I'm going to give you a project. I said, yeah, I remember you. So he gave me a project. <laughs> he worked for me before. I think I treated him very nice, so he hired me. Uh, so, and he was very fast. He was young and a man in a hurry. He designed me. I mean, he hired me. Signed so contract within six months. Construction started. Uh, a typical mixed commercial with a shopping podium, parking, and uh, condominium blocks. Uh, we designed a lot of so-called social space, space and a recreational floor and so on. Uh, and a swimming uh, gymnasium like, like a bridge span across the swimming pool. And this is a so-called a furniture museum and center in Setapa, in Setapa uh, KL. Same thing. I design, I want a building to be like, a, not just a furniture center, it, it should be a community center with a lot of interactive space to encourage interaction between different uh, category of communities to be there together. Besides going to shop for furniture, they can go there for food and so on. It was designed to be a so-called uh, building, this, what building design, some Malaysia design index, green design index like Pretinum. So we hire a green consultant to, to come up some simulation for us. It is not built yet, it might be built a few years from now. For the same owner, I designed a sports complex for them, multi-story sports complex for them. I remember the first time I went to visit the site, I went there with one young man, he dressed up very nice and so on. And then later I realized he was the son of MO1. You know who's MO1? Malaysian official one. And then a few weeks ago, yeah, I saw the newspaper. He was the same person who went to see a, the actress in Taiwan. Uh. <laughs> <coughs> so I visited the site with him. Uh. So what happened was the land belonged to DBKL. DB, uh, the Kuala Lumpur City Hall is the biggest land owner in Malaysia. So they own a lot of land. My clients want to build something. The easiest way is to get a land from government because you don't have to pay upfront money. So it is easy for you. Uh, we come up with some proposal. Instead of buy the land, pay them cash upfront, we say, how about we build something in exchange for the land? So we decided that we will design a sports complex but I told him it shouldn't be a single-use box complex with a football stadium. This initially, that's what they want to do. I said, it'll be empty. I said, it should be a multiple-use sports complex with all sorts of sports activity, with swimming pool, diving pool, badminton, indoor soccer, rock climbing, and so on. It should be a community center also with a post office, with library, everything inside. And they agree. And we started to design. And it, it's going to be the focus of the whole community. It is like a community center, a neighborhood center, an urban village. We went to visit some 
sports facility in Taipei, I, I came up with this initial concept. To me, I want to have the main entrance to enter from the inside. But eventually, the, the Dato Banda want the entrance to be in front, the mayor KL. And we came up many, many options. Huh? Many options, one after another. So this is more or less the final options. It was a feature in many ma magazines and so on. Yeah. Mm. To me, a, sculpt, uh, a sports compact should be very dynamic because it's like something to do with movement, sports. So it should be very dynamic. It's not just a space. It is also a symbol mm, of the community. The community can be proud of. This is a, uh, the final launch. Construction started. Uh, two and a half years ago. Hmm. Those are the photographs taken a few weeks ago. Construction. And the building uh, recently won the best award, award for public architecture in Asia Pacific in the ceremony in Bangkok a few months ago. So, big architecture in the whole Asia Pacific. Hmm. And uh, this is my mother. To me, my mother is, is the, the most important person in my life. I, when I was in USA, for many years, I, I didn't want to come back. I mean, last time there was no internet, no cell phone, no Wi-Fi and so on. Many years, I never see my mom because I was like, highly egoistic. I told myself, I don't want to come back to Malaysia until I become world famous. Yeah. So <clears throat> after I worked in Princeton, New York for four years, my mother and my sister came to see me. In my image, imagination and in my dream, I always thought my mother was a big giant figure, just like the river in my kampong, I thought. And I went, when I went to pick up my mother in the airport, in the uh, John F. Kennedy Airport in, in New York, and I saw my mother, she was so skinny, so small, so short. So I told myself I want to go back to, to Malaysia. And a year later, I think two years later, in 1991, I went back to Malaysia before I became world famous. So I, I went back to Malaysia. <laughs> I gave up my American dream to go back to Malaysia to be with my mother. And uh, my, mother passed, my mother passed away in uh, October 2010. And I told myself, my mother is no longer this, so I don't have to be in Malaysia anymore. Yeah, so I don't have to be in Malaysia anymore. In 2012, I traveled to Africa with Michael Teo, my, my, my client, Dr. Michael Teo Piketty. We went to Tanzania and Kenya. We went to Maasai Mara. You travel to Maasai Mara. You go out in the big open space. It's like, it's like in Texas. It reminded me of Texas. So I, I was a bit sad. I think about my mother. I, I think about what happened in Malaysia. And I have the so-called midlife crisis in Maasai Mara. And then suddenly I saw this beautiful acacia tree. I asked him to stop. I said, I, I have to be in this acacia tree. And I took a picture. So I had my inspiration. Just like the Lord Buddha under some kind of tree. I have an inspiration. I told myself, I want to go back to USA. So there was a moment I said, look, I don't want to be in Malaysia anymore. I, I remember May 5th, 2013, Two days before May 5, 2013, in the general election, I went out to have lunch with Tato Tongkomau, my ex-boss from Sunrise. He was formerly with the MCA. He was a state ESCO with the Sango government before. He told me, this time it's for real. Opposition is going to win. But opposition lost. So I said, I don't want to be in Malaysia anymore. So <laughs> since my mother is no longer in this world, I don't have to be in Malaysia. So a few days later, I emailed to a, to, to, to a few friends. I said, anybody knows any architect in Seattle? I want to go to Seattle. So one guy said he knows one guy by the name of Peter Liang. He's an architect. So I emailed to Peter Liang. I said, I want to come to Seattle. Can I use your office address to set up my office? He said, OK. So May 25th, I went to Seattle, 2013. He picked me up from the airport. In three weeks' time, I set up a company, Kunin Studio LLC, something like Sunim Bahad. I bought a house. I moved in my furniture in three weeks in Seattle. That's how fast it is. And then also, 
after I moved in my house, I received a phone call. And I got my first job in Seattle. I, I received a phone call from somebody by the name of Sam Yi. He called me. He speaks like American. At first, I thought he's American based in Chongqing. He said, can you remember me? I, I, I wanted to offer you a job to design a shopping center in Chongqing a year ago. Are you still interested? I say, yes, I'm still interested. A long time ago, I signed a contract with you, with my company from Singapore. Uh, and he asked me, is the fee still the same? I said, is the, the figure still the same? But to, you have to change Sing dollar to US dollar. <laughs> so he hired me. That's how, that's how I went there. I got my first project. From this American Chinese, I thought he's American Chinese. And then he hired me, paid me a down payment. I went to Chongqing to, to see this guy for the first time. And he spoke to me in Hokkien. He said he was from Tanjong Marim. <laughs> <laughs> he was from Tanjong Marim. He was a small world. <laughs> so, so this is Seattle. Seattle is a very unusual city. Small city, 700,000 population, surrounded by water. Uh, the entire metropolitan Seattle is only has three million population. But the gross national products of Seattle is much bigger than entire Malaysia. Seattle is IT city. Uh, all the big firms like Amazon.com, second largest company in the world, is in Seattle. Microsoft headquarters in Seattle. Boeing headquarters in Seattle. Uh, Starbucks headquarters in Seattle. Costco, T-Mobile, or Hester in Seattle. This is downtown Seattle. My office is here. My house somewhere here near the University of Washington. University of Washington, my house downtown. The richest person in the world, Jeff Bezos, and the second richest person in the world, Bill Gates, all live in, in this area called Madeira. Uh, so it's a very unusual city, but it's a very humble city. If you drive around Seattle, you thought KL is a much richer city in Seattle. They are very humble, very down to earth. Uh, Bruce, uh, Lee Xiaolong grew up in Seattle. He went to the University of Washington in Seattle. So that's what I like about Seattle. I went to Seattle. This is a park near my house. I live in the urban area. I always go there. In fact, summertime, sometimes I do my, my work in the park with a, with, a, with a bottle of wine, with some nuts. I can work in the park. And uh, my son, my wife, my wife, she spends six months a year in Malaysia. When it's cooler, she'll come back to Malaysia. A uh, warmer time, she'll be in, in, in Seattle. This is Mount Rainy. It's almost like Mount Fiji. My first project, as I mentioned to you, with my company in Seattle was for somebody in Chongqing, China. Second project was also not in Seattle because I just set up, nobody wanted to hire me. So I asked my friend who donated a lot of money to Suzy Foundation. Uh, I said, since uh, you love to help people, why don't you help me now? <laughs> I'm your friend, I have no project. So he hired me and I designed this building for, her, for him in KLCC. Construction is going to start anytime soon. So it was my second project for my company in Seattle. Because I, I managed to convince him. I said, look, ah, now I need help. Just imagine I'm a Sushi Foundation. <laughs> and then my third project built was a Lebanese restaurant in, uh, in Seattle. A restaurant. And then I get to know somebody from Taiwan. They wanted to build an apartment in downtown Seattle. And I team up, this is me, I team up with GUS Architecture. The guy, Peter Liang, who, picked, who I didn't know, know in my life until five years ago, who picked me up from the airport, who let me use his office, who took me to IKEA to buy furniture, helped me to ship my furniture to my house. I gave him a lot of job. I work out with my first project in Chongqing, I team up with him. Uh, my second big project, I team up with him as well. So, so sometimes it pays to be, 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 to be nice. Okay. So this is a so-called condominium project in Seattle, in downtown Seattle. In Seattle, they talk about urban space. The city has certain guidelines. It's very strict to follow. To them, every building in downtown Seattle has to be a 24-hour city, a 24-hour building. Ground floor, they call first, so it had to be like, public building, shops or restaurant or bookstore and so on. It cannot be residential. And you have to provide public facility at the ground floor, like a bench for people to sit down. 
and uh, some some space for you to keep a bicycle and so on. It must be nicely landscape so people can walk. And then, of course, the roof garden is compulsory. You must have a roof garden. It's compulsory. It's like in Singapore. Of course, you have to study all the sun, sun penetration, sunlight, sun orientation, and so on. It's under construction, almost completed. Near, near the ocean, it's almost completed. <clears throat> And many, many years ago, I think in uh, 2014, uh, July, uh, in, I think June, July, I was supposed to bring, to bring my family to Seattle as a new immigrant to Seattle. Uh, June 2014, a group of people from Iran, they came to see me uh, from a city called Khoi. This guy, he's an imam or the, big mosque, the mosque in Khoi. I think this guy is a mayor. They came to see me. And I happened to have a, during the times I have a student or, or a young architect from all over working for me. They're like young intern from Spain and this one young architect from Iran. She was working for me, so she served as my translator. They came to see me. At first I thought they came to Malaysia for visit. On the sideline, they came to visit, stop by to see me. And later I found out they they came all the way just to see me. Spent one night, the next day they went back to Iran. They came to see me. And then the reason they came to see me is they wanted me to design a mosque for them in Koi. And then I told them, I'm a Catholic, and I never designed a mosque before. And the Iman, he told me, precisely because I'm a non-Muslim, I'm a Catholic, so he, wants me, he wanted me to design a mosque for him. He wanted me to design a mosque with a different perspective. And then he continued, he said he read, some articles about me, about, I always talk about my mother. He told me in Islam, the mother and God are equal. So since I love my mom very much, I must love God. That's what he wanted me to be the architect for his masjid. And then I know, I say I can design the mosque with the company from USA and so on, but US have a sanction against Iran. And then this guy said, he's a businessman based in Dubai. He, ran, he said, don't, don't worry, he can pay me from his office in Dubai. So I agreed to visit the site the following week before I brought my children to Seattle. And then before I make my trip to, to Iran, I went to see my friend in Singapore, Edward Lau. Edward Lau is a number two guy in a company called SCDA, Chan Su Ken. Su Ken is from Penang. He's one of the most famous architects in the world from Singapore. And then Edward Lau, when I mentioned to Edward, I wanted to go to Iran to visit this project and design more for him. He advised me, don't go. He mentioned to me that Chan Su Ken, what happened to Chan Su Ken? He, he got a job in Iran. He went to Iran to visit, to have meeting. The following week from Tehran, he flew to New York to visit his son and so on. He was interviewed at the airport for more than 10 hours by the US Homeland Security. So I did not accept the job because I worry about this thing, especially my children are going to U.S. as, as a new immigrant. So I did not accept the job. I feel very bad. I was like, I feel regretted why I did not accept the job. And then I moved to Seattle in, in August 2016. I received an email. Somebody wanted me to design a mosque for them. It was very funny. So they invited me, they paid me down payment. And I designed most in this, uh, in Seattle. And, and the, all those people, they are from, from Iran, from Syria, from all kinds, all, all over Middle East and so on. And I begin to design most uh, to incorporate an existing house. The most supposed to be, it's not just a mosque, it's also have a school, Sunday school and sports facility and so on. So as usual, I sketch out manually. So on, print sketch, and then withdraw. And he wanted, the Iman initially wanted to design a min mineral, big min mineral and so on. I told him we shouldn't do that because uh, uh, we are in Pacific Northwest in Seattle. We have to be a good neighbor. The building shouldn't be too loud, should be very elegant, should be more in harmony in the, with the neighbors and so on. And then he, he he asked me, what happened to my minerals? I want a big minerals and so on. 
uh, I said, look, last time we have mirror because you have a speaker. You want to inform the neighbor that you should go for prayer and so on. Now you inform your people by Facebook and so on. By all social media, you don't need a speaker anymore. So you can turn the staircase into a lantern. This is a staircase. So he agreed. Uh, he agreed. That's how I come out of the design. He accepted. And we produce the drones after drones. And we, are, we submitted the drones to the city hall many years, two years ago. We are still waiting for the lenses to meet approval because of a certain parking issue. And we hope the construction can start maybe sometime next year. It is a simple building way, quiet, understated, because I wish I believe it is a right design for the immigrants from Middle East. They are in a new environment. They should be, should be more understated so that they can get along with the local community. And uh, through this project, I feel like I can be part of the community in Seattle, finally, not just with the so-called local white community, Anglo-Saxon community, and also with the immigrant community. Uh, this is my last slide. <clears throat> uh, it is a quotation by Louis Kahn. Louis Kahn is considered, was considered one of the greatest architects in the last century. I like Louis Kahn for many reasons. He was a poet. He think in a very simple term, in a very simple poetic term. And uh, I visited all his building, including the, the Salt Institute in San Diego, La Jolla. And I also visited his uh, library in New Hampshire. When they asked him why he designed the library in such a way, why he has a reading space in all the perimeter with the windows, why he have all the bookshelves in the middle. His answer was, you go to some, some place where, which is very dark to pick up a book. You go to somewhere that's bright to read a book. It's so simple. It's like, to me, it's very philosophical. And then they asked him, why you want the building to look like this? He said, I did not want the building to look like this. I asked a brick what the brick want to be. The brick want to be like this. So, so to him, it is supposed to be. It was supposed to be. It was supposed to be. That's what I want to conclude my presentation with a quotation by Louis Kahn. What was has always been. What is has always been. What will be has always been. I'm always inspired by him. Thank you very much. Yeah.